Hi everyone, uh, my name is Owen Barden and I am uh, Associate Professor in Disability Studies here at Liverpool Hope and uh, Babs has asked me to do this uh, lecture for you on uh, assistive technology so uh, I'm calling it uh, disability and uh, assistive technology because disability studies is my area. <clears throat> so the first thing I want you to think about is this question here, right? What is technology? So what comes to mind when you hear that word, right? What does technology mean to you? <clears throat> now, chances are you thought of some kind of device, right? Um, so we think about things you know, like our phones, right? Things with buttons, things with screens, things that flash, right? We think about those kinds of things as what technology is. But I want you to think about technology in a slightly different way uh, because it's a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> so I'm going to draw here on the definition of uh, a scholar called Neil Selwyn, uh, who uh, specialises in research around uh, technology in education. And I want you to get past the idea that technology is just the stuff, right? So that's why it says at the top of the slide here that technology is more than just machines. <clears throat> um, technology is really about uh, enabling us to do things, right? In, technology enables us to do things faster, better, uh, cheaper, or even things that we perhaps couldn't do before, right? So technology is the, the skill, the art or the craft of being able to do things better, faster, quicker, cheaper, or that we couldn't even do before and, and understanding how to do that. So um, the word techne, we get it originally from uh, Greek, right, around skill, art and craft, but it actually has its origins further back than that in Sanskrit to do with sort of weaving, right, and bringing things together. It's the same root word uh, as textile, right? Same word. So it's that it's that weaving together and skill and art and craft and knowing how to do stuff, <clears throat> being able to do stuff. That's what technology is, right? It's what enables us to do stuff. <clears throat> And we can think about technology as having three components. So yes, there are the devices, there are the phones and the computers and the whatnot. So uh, what we've got on the screen here is artifacts and devices. Of course we have those, but there are two other important elements of what constitutes technology. <clears throat> so as well as artifacts and devices, we've got activities and practices. In other words, what people do with the stuff. So we've got the stuff and then what people do with the stuff. And then thirdly, uh, we've got context. So social arrangements and organizing forms, institutions, structures, and cultures. So these are the, this is the sort of wider environment in which uh, artifacts and devices and activities and practices can or perhaps can't happen. So the example on the screen a moment ago was a mobile phone. Uh, so that would be the, the artifact or the device. There's the activities and practices. So that's uh, what uh, the phone enables you to do, which is nowadays obviously a huge array of things uh, to the point where actually calling someone on the telephone has almost become a sort of minority practice. Uh, and then you've got the context. So in order to be able to use your phone, you need not just the phone, you need the uh, ability to pay the bill. You need a mobile phone uh, network provider. You need, uh, so you need a company right, to, that will help you to do that. You need all the telecoms and internet in infrastructure to trans transmit your messages and whatnot uh, you know, around the country and around the globe. So you need that broader, uh, that broader context as well. <clears throat> So technologies are made up of these three components, right? Artifacts and devices, the things, right? Activities and practices, what the things enable you to do, and uh, the broader social arrangements that enable or inhibit certain kinds of activity. 
Okay, so that's uh, our definition of technology. And we'll move along now to think more specifically about how technology relates to disability. Um, so um, here are some very common um, assistive devices um, associated with disability. So if I asked you to name, you know, what kind of assistive technologies do you know about? I bet you would come up probably with, with things like this. And obviously there are hundreds, right? We could come up with loads, uh, but I'm keeping it to, uh, to just these three. So prosthetics, uh, screen readers and wheelchairs. <clears throat> So um, prosthetics are um, uh, devices, you know, like artificial limbs, uh, artificial uh, um, organs like eyes, for instance, pacemakers, even things that um, um, fulfill or uh, replace the function of a, of a missing or partially missing or not fully functioning body part. So yeah, things like, you know, artificial arms, artificial legs, artificial eyes, maybe things like that would be associated with disability and they are assistive technologies. <clears throat> um, thinking in more sort of digital terms, uh, digital technologies, we've got things like uh, screen readers, right? So uh, software usually that will read out what is ever on your uh, computer screen or your, or your mobile phone screen. Uh, and these um, uh, are, are quite common, right, in, uh, in, in schools and in classrooms um, and in universities even. Uh, and then we have another kind of assistive device, which um, you would probably associate with disability, that of the wheelchair, <clears throat> right, which is a device, a technology which, which helps people get around, right? It's a, it's a, a mobility device. <clears throat> now, what I want you to appreciate and think about is that something interesting happens when technology meets disability. And this is a bit like uh, play, a bit like art, a bit like music, in the sense that most, you know, when most people play games, right, or when they play music or when they create art, you know, it's considered playing or music or art. It's a perfectly normal thing to do, right? It's a perfectly ordinary thing to do. But when disability or special educational needs enter the frame, suddenly it shifts, right? And it becomes not art and it's for its own sake as a creative or aesthetic endeavor, uh, the same with music. Um, and play isn't play for its own sake, suddenly it becomes therapy, right? We hear about music therapy, art therapy, play therapy, and all these therapies when disability or special educational needs enter the frame. And there's a, a parallel or a similar scenario with technology when we stop to think about it. So glasses, right? I've got them on, right? I bet some of you have too, right? But they are without doubt, right? The most common prosthetic on earth, right? They are a technology, they're a device that um, augments the function of an organ, your eyes, which aren't working as well as they should, right? Just like uh, uh, an artificial leg, right? Augments the function of uh, a limb that is missing or isn't working as it should, right? So glasses, right, are the most common prosthetic, but we don't really tend to think of them as assistive technologies. <clears throat> uh, the same with, something you've probably got on your phone, right? Siri or whatever equivalent it is with the brand of phone you're, you're using. <clears throat> so Siri allows you to dictate commands and it will also tell you, it will read out to you um, what, is on, uh, what is on your screen. So in that sense, it's very similar to what we think of as an assistive device uh, uh, in terms of something like a screen reader. And finally, right, a bicycle, right, is a two-wheeled device much like a wheelchair, it's a mobility device, it helps us get around and get to places faster or that we wouldn't be, perhaps be, be able to get to otherwise, right? But again, we don't think of a bicycle as an assistive technology, right? It's just technology. It's just a, it's just a kind of, it's just something that we use to get around, right? But when disability enters the frame, right, we 
tend to think differently for some reason. We tend to think, oh, wheelchairs, there's some kind of special technology, a special mobility device for special people. <clears throat> and it's that kind of um, strange relationship with, with disability and uh, technology that I want to just explore a little bit further now. <clears throat> so the question I want you to think about uh, and you, perhaps you can explore this in your groups, right, is who is being assisted by what? So it is absolutely beyond a question of a doubt that assistive technologies do help disabled people, right? People definitely benefit from having assistive technologies like prosthetics, like screen readers, like wheelchairs in their lives, right? That is beyond question. <clears throat> But what is also beyond question is that non-disabled people have been assisted hugely by devices initially designed for disabled people. There are, you know, endless examples of this, some of which you perhaps don't realise. So something as simple as the power button, right, on, on a desktop computer. Now, uh, if you've got one, you might be able to have a look at it now. If not, you've probably seen one, but you will know that these days the power button on a desktop computer, right, on a, on a PC, is on the front, right? Not only that, it is normally recessed slightly, as it's in a little dimple, and it's also lit, right, normally green or red, depending on whether it's on or off. So we have those three features um, just on the power button. Of, a, of an ordinary computer. Why do we have them there, right? They're not, they're not like that because, you know, some genius at Dell just, just came up with that one day. In the olden days, and I'm talking say 20 years ago, the power button for a PC was always on the back out of the way, right? It was a big switch on the back in amongst a load of other cables. It was out the back, I think, so that the, the, the sort of tower, the PC itself would look nice and sleek and not have this big bulky button on it. <laughs> But of course, you know, if you have got um, a visual impairment or if you've got limited mobility, then a button you have to reach around for on the back right, isn't, isn't really that great, right? And so it was from the experiences of disabled people that the power button got moved on to the front, got put in its little dimple so you could find it with your finger if you couldn't see very well, uh, and also lit, so again, so you could find it nice and easy. And we all right, benefit from that. <clears throat> Similarly, um, I've mentioned um, Siri a moment ago. So both Siri in terms of the voice recognition component that allows you to, to tell it what you want and the screen reader function that uh, allows it to tell you what's on, what's on the screen, again, that those um, that technology has not uh, arrived because some genius at Apple thought it up one day. Both screen readers and um, uh, dictation software originated as technologies uh, invented for disabled people who couldn't uh, communicate easily in the normative ways. <laughs> and you know, so if you use Siri or anything like it then you have benefited from the insights and contribution that people, uh, disabled people have made to technology. Uh, something that you will have definitely done, I'm sure, is send some sort of text message, right? Whether that is uh, uh, an SMS text message or on WhatsApp or Messenger or Snapchat or whatever it is, right? You will have definitely sent uh, a text message, I am sure. <clears throat> now, the uh, creators of mobile phones never envisaged, uh, and the networks, the mobile phone networks, never envisaged that uh, texting would be a major use uh, of mobile phones. The, re the reason texting was originally on there was for mobile phone telecoms engineers to be able to send short messages to each other. It was never meant to be uh, a public function, really. Uh, it was just for it was just for the the telecoms workers to use to send short messages to each other, hence SMS. But what happened was 
Um, deaf people discovered this feature. Uh, deaf people obviously not generally finding making audio phone calls terribly easy, right? Um, so deaf people discovered this SMS feature and started using it wildly, right? Started sending tons and tons of text messages, right? The phone companies realized then there was a market for this, right? There was money to be made from it. <clears throat> and so uh, that's the reason so that you're able to send all the kinds of text messages that you can do now, right? So you owe that effectively, right, to the experience of deaf people. You owe the ability to text to deaf people. So this is what I'm saying when I say that non-disabled people have assisted hugely by devices or activities and practices uh, initially designed for disabled people. <clears throat> And I would really encourage you as a, a companion, right, to this lecture to watch this TED talk by Elise Roy uh, called When We Design for Disability We All Benefit. Elise Roy is a deaf, uh, uh, deaf designer, I also helped to work on the UN Convention for the uh, Rights of Disabled People. Um, and she's arguing really that we need to think uh, about how we design technology. We need to flip how we think on its head. So rather than designing for the quote normal, right, or average person, and then inventing some sort of alternative or um, uh, bolt on access, me access measure for people who are disabled, instead, right, design with disability, right, design with diversity in mind from the outset, so that the maximum number of people can use the technology in the way they want from the beginning and the easier something is to use the more people benefit right the, i mean the greater number of people benefit um, regardless of whether they are disabled or not as we've seen as we've just seen right with siri it's very easy to use all you have to do is speak right and it doesn't matter whether you're disabled or not you can still use it <clears throat> so we all benefit One of the um, interesting things I think now about so-called assistive technologies and things like Siri is they are gradually eroding the distinction between uh, disability and ability. So the fact that uh, non-disabled people will use something like Siri in the same way that a disabled person would is really starting to blur those distinctions between disability and ability and between what is or what has been called today assistive technology, and what we just think of as, 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 as technology. Right? In other words, these kinds of distinctions are interestingly going to start to break down, and that has implications for how we think about disability, how we think about disabled people, uh, and how we even think about, about humans. And that might sound a bit dramatic, but I'm gonna show you what I mean. <clears throat> So this um, slide says non, uh, not science fiction at the top. And I'm just gonna introduce you very quickly to some real technologies that are out there in the world right now uh, that really uh, present some really interesting uh, dilemmas and questions around the role of technology and around what it means to be, to be human. <clears throat> Um, so the first of these uh, is brain machine interfaces. So these are mechanisms, means by which uh, people can control machinery with their brains. Now that might sound a bit far fetched, but it is happening, right? So people wear these kind of electrode caps uh, and with those caps, they can control um, machines. So, for example, uh, there's a competition every year in uh, Switzerland called the Cybathlon. It's a bit like a kind of Olympic Games, right, but for, for disability technology. And one of the events uh, is like people play video games. They play like a racing game, uh, like piloting like a, a spaceship right on a, on a video screen, on a video game screen. The competitors, the athletes, 
uh, are paralyzed, are paraplegic, right? They, 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 they can't use their limbs. Uh, and so they can control uh, what happens on the screen. They can control the, 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 uh, the video game by thought. Right. Pretty amazing, right? But it is happening. But then think about what the implications for that are, right? If we can do that now, then we're not far away from thought controlled wheelchairs, from thought controlled cars, right? There's one step in, in between sort of completely driverless cars, thought controlled cars and other vehicles. Um, and you being able to control your own phone, right? Your own, your own computer just by thought. It will happen, right? Because it is already happening. <clears throat> Uh, the next one is uh, intelligent prostheses. So these are prostheses, firstly, which are powered uh, to make them easier to use. So they have some electrical power to make them easy to, or perhaps pneumatic to make them easier to use. But they also learn, right? So they have some kind of uh, a computerization, a microprocessor in it, so that it will recognize when you're standing up and sitting down or going up and down stairs rather than just walking along the flat. And not only that, it will learn to recognize an individual's gait, right? In other words, the distinctive way in which they walk <coughs> or move it if it's another part of uh, if it's another part of the body. So intelligent prostheses <coughs> are happening. What this means is uh, one of the things it could mean is that um, we will get to a point where somebody using prosthetic legs can run further and jump higher, for instance, than somebody using natural human legs. And then the question becomes, well, you know, are people going to start to deliberately amputate perfectly good limbs and have prosthetic ones come on so they can do things that, uh, that um, ordinary people couldn't? So a couple of years ago, for example, uh, there was a girl in America. Sorry, that was the dog. A couple of years ago, there was a girl in America. She was 11 years old. Uh, she was missing uh, the uh, bottom half of one arm from the elbow down. She used a 3D printer to print her own prosthesis. It was purple. It was cone shape and it shot glitter out the end. Right. I kid you not. Right. You can look this up on the internet, right? She invented her own prosthesis to suit her own kind of uh, desires, right? Um, so it's not so far-fetched to think that people might, might deliberately uh, um, replace organic body parts with, uh, uh, with uh, prosthetic ones by choice. <clears throat> And um, this leads me to the, the third one, which is uh, neuro enhancements. So this is the idea that we can enhance our thinking, we can enhance our intelligence, we can enhance our, our brains and our capacity to learn. People are already doing this um, with drugs, right? So there are drugs like uh, modafinil and even Ritalin, which you may have heard of because um, it is used often prescribed for uh, children and teenagers who are labelled as having attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. But people uh, who have not had any kind of medical diagnosis are taking these drugs because they can improve your ability to stay alert, to concentrate and to memorise. So in one sense, neuroenhancement is already happening. And in fact, university students particularly at the elite universities in the States, are some of the biggest uh, users of these drugs, or illicit users of these drugs. <clears throat> so in the one sense, neuroenhancement is already happening. In a second sense, um, it, we're not too far away from a kind of matrix type scenario where people will have the ability to have some sort of chip or implant uh, in order to boost their cognitive capacity, right? boost their intelligence. Now, again, you might think, yuck, right? Nobody's actually going to do that. But I can assure you they will, right? If someone's going like, to invent a glitter gun prosthesis, somebody's going to have a brain enhancement if they get the chance. So, for instance, there's a guy in, uh, there's, there's a guy, there's a surgeon in uh, Italy who already wants to do the first head transplant, right? Whole human head from one body to another. And there's a guy, a Russian guy, who's volunteered to be the, to be the recipient. 
right? A whole head transplant from one body onto another, right? So if you think someone won't put a chip in their brain, you're wrong, right? It will happen. <clears throat> it might have already for all we know, right? But that's neuro enhancement. <clears throat> and then uh, thirdly, we've got uh, social robotics. <clears throat> Now, this is the idea of robots that interact with people. So socially is what happens when people get together. Um, social robotics is for social interaction between people and robots. So this might be one use of this is uh, with um, older people, right? So people are creating, for instance, in Japan, you will perhaps not be surprised to hear, right? But, but carer robots, right? Uh, robots who will interact with and fulfill the caring function for older people. Uh, and we're also beginning to see um, robots in some instances used in schools. So this is a French robot that was produced uh, for use um, in, uh, in primary schools and it was uh, deliberately targeted at uh, children with uh, a diagnostic label of autism who are often thought to struggle with certain aspects of human communication interaction, right? Like reading emotions, like, uh, like eye contact. And a large part of what these robots are actually meant to do, uh, I say designed or, or, or placed in these classrooms to do, was to try and uh, teach uh, uh, kids labeled as autistic how to interact with, with, with other humans. Why you would get a robot to do that and not other humans is uh, something that you might want to think about. <clears throat> okay, now, if you want to find out more about this, um, I would strongly suggest that you look at Elise Roy's video, her TED talk here on design for disability. Uh, I also would strongly suggest you look at this uh, trailer uh, for a documentary that was made a few years ago called Fixed, right? The Science of Human Enhancement uh, that covers, it's only seven minutes long. There's only a trailer for it, um, uh, for the full film, but it does cover uh, a lot of what I've just talked about in this lecture. Uh, and uh, finally, at the end of the presentation, the end of the PowerPoint, uh, there are some uh, suggestions for further reading. What I hope this lecture gives you the opportunity to do is to think about what the implications are for, uh, for technology and particularly these technological uh, developments and enhancements that we're seeing now. <clears throat> so we thought about what does the relationship between disability and technology look like? That's one thing we've been thinking about uh, that you might like to reflect on. And then we've also got uh, some other implications based on these uh, current and near future developments that I've just been talking about. So you might want to think about what are the implications of technology, <coughs> uh, these relationships and uh, inventions, these advances, right, for children. What do they mean for children? What do they mean for teachers? What do they mean for education more broadly? And even what does it mean for our sense of what it means to be a human being. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Um, those are the suggested uh, references. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed that. And that's the end of the lecture.